Welcome to the Taste of Life channel. In Saudi Arabia, Mecca, the holiest site in Islam, encountered severe storms and heavy rainfall, resulting in disruptions for pilgrims, school closures, and scenes of chaos. Videos captured the sight of drenched pilgrims slipping on the wet floor while performing the tawaf, circumambulation, around the Kaaba. Unusual occurrences unfolded at the colossal black cube, which serves as the focal point of Muslim prayer. This flood incident serves as a reminder of a similar event mentioned in the Bible, known as Noah's Flood. It raises inquiries about the reasons behind God's decision to bring about a cataclysmic flood, leading to the destruction of the world during Noah's time. The recent flood in 2023 and Noah's Flood both evoke a sense of great fear among people, prompting contemplation on whether these events serve as a punishment from God or a warning to humanity. If you wish, feel free to share a prayer in the comments section, engaging in communal reflection and seeking God's guidance. Now, let me pose a question related to Noah's flood. How did Noah determine that the waters had receded and it was safe to disembark from the ark? Please select your answer from the following options. A dove returned with an olive leaf in its beak. B. Noah received a message from an angel. C. The ark came to rest on Mount Sai. D. Noah saw a rainbow in the sky. Kindly write your response in the comments section below. The flood that took place during the time of Noah was a consequence of a catastrophic event that led God to send a flood as a means of destroying the world. Scripture emphasizes the widespread sinfulness present on earth as the cause for this divine judgment. Noah's flood serves as a symbol, foreshadowing the future judgment that God will bring upon the entire world. The conditions prevalent in the last days are predicted to resemble those of Noah's time. While the Bible does not explicitly state the reasons behind God's choice of a flood as the method of destruction, there are various possibilities to consider. One reason may be that God intended to reset his creation back to its original state, undoing the consequences of human sin. The flood served as a punishment for the moral decay of humanity and resulted in the loss of all terrestrial life. The historical account in Genesis 6:12 reveals that the earth had become corrupt, contrasting with God's initial declaration that creation was very good. In the tenth generation from Adam, humanity had grown so wicked and corrupt that only Noah and his family were spared from the impending judgment. God's decision to flood the earth originated from his profound grief and remorse over creating such sinful beings. It is important to note that the flood was not an expression of God's anger or impulsive reaction, but rather a response to the pervasive wickedness that prevailed in the world. By preserving a remnant of life through Noah, God ensured the continuation of his plan. Humanity had seemingly reached a critical juncture where, without divine intervention, they would likely have faced self-destruction. God intervened and brought an end to the wickedness prevalent during those days. Genesis 6, 1-4 sheds further light on God's decision to bring about the destruction of the world. These verses mention three distinct groups, the sons of God, the daughters of humans, and the Nephilim. Various interpretations exist regarding these groups, one suggesting that the sons of God were descendants of Seth the daughters of humans were descendants of Cain, and the Nephilim were their offspring. However, a more plausible explanation identifies the sons of God as the same group mentioned in the book of Job, where they are referred to as angels. According to this interpretation, it is proposed that there was a union between angels and humans, resulting in the birth of the Nephilim. The book of Enoch also describes a similar scenario, where a group of angels known as Watchers had offspring with human women, resulting in giants who engaged in predatory behavior towards humans and imparted forbidden knowledge. While some may dismiss this account as purely fictional, references in Jude 1, 1, 6, and 2 Peter 2, 4 to the punishment of fallen angels draw from the Book of Enoch, suggesting that there may be some validity to the narrative. This alternative explanation adds further insight into the reasons behind God's decision to send the flood, particularly concerning the influence of fallen angels on humanity. Another reason for the flood can be found in the writings of Peter and Corinthians, where historical events described in scripture are regarded as examples of God's punishment for sin. These passages specifically mention the fallen angels and the flood during Noah's time as illustrations of the fate that awaits the ungodly. While God does not immediately execute judgment for every transgression, 
he has presented numerous examples of the consequences that accompany sinful behavior. Although our punishment may be delayed, it is inevitable. The flood serves as a reminder that judgment awaits those who persist in rebelling against God. The flood had two distinct purposes. Firstly, it served as a response to the widespread sinfulness of humanity, which had reached its peak and potentially involved the influence of fallen angels. Secondly, it stands as an example and a reminder of God's judgment upon those who choose to live in rebellion. The flood serves as a powerful demonstration of God's unwavering seriousness when it comes to addressing human sinfulness. According to the teachings of the Bible, mankind was created in the image of God and is expected to live in accordance with his laws. When these laws are violated, judgment ensues due to God's holiness and justice. While certain forms of punishment may be evident during our earthly lives, the ultimate and final punishment awaits the day of judgment. It is established that it is appointed for human beings to die once, and after death comes the moment of judgment. This judgment is depicted in the book of Revelation, and in the case of those living on earth during Noah's time, God determined that their actions warranted the penalty he imposed. This leads us to a final reason for the flood. Considering the circumstances that led to the flood in Noah's era, it is a solemn realization that this event serves as a symbolic representation in scripture of God's ultimate judgment. Jesus himself used it as an analogy to describe the state of the world before his second coming and the establishment of his kingdom. The element of surprise caught people off guard because they had disregarded God's warning. Jesus stated, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. There is a divine reason behind God's decision to eliminate a significant portion of humanity. The infiltration of satanic influence, represented by the offspring of fallen angels, had entered the human race. However, Noah stood apart as a righteous and blameless man, untainted by the sinful angelic lineage. His family lineage remained untainted as well. This purity of lineage rendered Noah, his sons, and their wives exempt from the destruction that befell all other human beings. Throughout history, Satan repeatedly attempted to hinder the fulfillment of God's plan to crush his head through the seed of the woman, as prophesied in Genesis 3.15. He attempted to thwart God's plan by causing the drowning of male babies in Egypt, through Balak and Balaam, as the Israelites approached the Promised Land, and through Haman's plot against the Jews, Satan also sought to prevent the birth of Jesus by Herod's massacre of the young boys in Bethlehem and by tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Satan did everything possible to prevent humanity from being saved by the sacrificial blood of the Lamb. If Satan couldn't outright kill Jesus or prevent the Jewish nation from producing the Messiah, he would try to hinder the atonement by causing Jesus to sin. For our Savior to serve as the sinless propitiation for our sins, he had to be without sin. We believe that the passage in Genesis 6.14 relates to one of Satan's early attempts to corrupt the entire human race with satanic seed, thereby eliminating the possibility of a sinless substitute who could provide atonement for all mankind's sins. The proclamation that Jesus made to those very angels who had infected the human race was a testament to God's victory over Satan's scheme. Jesus, the incarnation of God and a holy man, served as proof of that victory. God spared Noah and prevented the spread of the contamination through human procreation by eliminating all those who either carried the satanic seed or had the potential to do so through the flood. In doing so, God preserved the lineage he intended to use to bring his son into the world as our savior. The flood's reason extends beyond the sinfulness of humanity, encompassing a deeper and more significant aspect. When examining these four verses and other biblical passages, a more comprehensive understanding of why God chose to send the flood emerges. The mention of the sons of God and the daughters of men in verses 2 and 4 has sparked interpretation and debate. Some argue that the flood was a consequence of the intermarriage between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Those who support the angelic interpretation of the sons of God propose that only something as grave as angelic involvement with humanity could warrant such a catastrophic event. The identification of these sons of God mentioned in verses 2 and 4 garners diverse perspectives, 
with various ideas put forth and acknowledged by ancient Jewish exegesis, early Christian interpreters, and the authors of the New Testament. In the pre-Christian era, Jews believed that the term sons of God referred to supernatural beings, and this understanding was also embraced by the New Testament writers. However, in more recent times, there has been a broader acceptance of a non-supernatural interpretation of the sons of God. The phrase sons of God appears multiple times in the Old Testament, including in the book of Job 1 to 6, it denotes where it denotes both holy and fallen angels. In Job 38 to 7, the sons of God are identified as angels who rejoiced at the creation of the earth. Deuteronomy 32.43 also associates the phrase with angels. The only instance where sons of God is used to describe humans is in Hosea 1.10, where these humans are depicted as being in a covenant relationship with God. The term is never used to describe humans in rebellion against God. In the context of Genesis 6, it becomes evident that the term cannot refer to humans, as those described are not in a covenant relationship with God. Noah and his family were the only righteous individuals on earth during that time. As for the possibility of angels having sexual relations with humans, the account of Lot in Sodom provides an answer to this question. The men of Sodom desired to engage in sexual relations with the two angels who came to rescue Lot and his family. While angels in heaven do not partake in such relations, the angels mentioned in the New Testament were deviating from their proper domain and engaging in immoral behavior. Jude 7 explicitly states that these angels sinned in a similar manner to the men of Sodom and Gomorrah by pursuing strange flesh. This phrase refers to a different kind. Jude 6 and 7 clarify that these angels did not maintain their positions of authority and abandoned their proper dwelling. They sinned by engaging in sexual immorality. Sodom and Gomorrah serve as examples of those who face eternal punishment for their sexual immorality and perversion. Despite God's judgment, his mercy is evident in the flood account. He provided an escape for those who believed his warning and followed his instructions to build the ark. Noah, described as a just and righteous man, found favor in God's eyes. He preached righteousness and warned his generation of the impending judgment. Only a small group consisting of Noah and his family, a total of eight individuals, responded in faith and were saved. Presently, God's intention to exercise his authority by administering justice against human sinfulness and violence remains unchanged. The warnings issued during Noah's era and the subsequent flood retain their relevance and serve as a reminder of God's imminent judgment. Just as in the days of Noah, God has forewarned of impending judgment and provided a means of salvation. The ark stood as the sole refuge from divine judgment and entrance into it necessitated faith. Similarly, in the present day, we are called to place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the exclusive Savior for humanity burdened by sin. Salvation is attained through faith in His sacrificial death on the cross. It is solely by God's grace that we are saved, and there exists no other name in all of heaven by which we must be saved. Therefore, we are encouraged to have faith in God and steadfastly hold on to the preached gospel, recognizing its paramount significance that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Amen.